И у меня, ну как пролило, налило, и я чувствовала себя членом, сука, эрогированным членом. Знаешь, как оно, блядь, ну? Well, if you've been wondering where Hey Arnold's been, apparently he's trapped in this person's face. If anyone knows her, keep a plunger or a mini vac in your car in case you run into her and get him out of there. Good lord. Let's start the show. Hello, everybody. Episode 5 is upon us. The crazy train is ramping up. I mean, the level of crazy the world is enduring right now is astonishing. And I don't think I've ever actually used that word to describe anything before. But today's the day. The world today is astonishing. Doesn't it feel like the crazy train just kicked in the fifth gear? It feels like we were just in a tunnel. And now all of a sudden we're doing 500 miles an hour alongside the edge of a mountain with a 5,000 foot drop. The conductors passed out on fentanyl. The passengers are twerking with their asses hanging out the windows. That's what it feels like to live in America. Then if you speak up and question any of it, the guy who collects your ticket tells you to shut up and wear your mask while everyone on the train gives you the death stare. That's what it feels like to question anything that's going on here. Critical thinking is just no longer welcomed. Just shut up and do what you're told. Here's a woman assaulting us in an off trail. Get that pole away. Get it away from me. Get it away from me. You stupid. Stupid. You came close to them. You you stopped them from coming by. You completely caused this. We gave you more than six feet to come by us. You get away. Don't come in public places if you don't want to be around people. No mask. No mask. Well, don't worry. It's okay. Yeah, I miss the Hey, you need three masks. You only you got two. Yeah. You don't know the rules. Yeah. I've got two masks. Oh, yeah. We well, need three. Stay home, then. Don't come out here. It's unreal. Anyway, my friend Made by Jim Bob will be coming on the show later to help me figure out what the hell's going on here. Jim Bob's a popular political cartoonist. His stuff's featured in the Washington Examiner. He's known for challenging mainstream media narratives with these little comic strips that literally short-circuit people's brains who buy into everything they're spoon-fed. You know, as nutty as the world's become, I learned that if you don't follow the rules of this absurd new reality people are trying to create, you get the luxury to sit back and watch one of the most amazing reality shows ever made. Yeah, it's called The New Normal. It's amazing. And every day, in every city, there's a new episode with a new challenge. For example, in today's episode of New Normal Los Angeles, we have the don't scream on a roller coaster or you'll be thrown out of the park and accused of killing people's grandparents challenge. Try not to scream because it's not allowed on thrill rides at Disneyland, Knott's, and all other California theme parks. That's right, you'll have to ride roller coasters in silence, they say. It's part of the proposed new COVID safety guidelines. Screaming and shouting in public increases the risk for the virus to spread. The plan is being backed by the California Attractions and Parks Association. Yeah, these are part of the let's see how many stupid people will do anything we tell them challenge. I can't wait for the stop breathing when you walk past someone challenge. I read a spoiler somewhere that said that was coming in a future episode. My favorite episode's the one where the producers made band kids at school play their instruments inside of beekeeper tents. Look at this. At Wenatchee High School, kids faced the music from inside a small tent. The principal says the district collaborated with local health officials who say the tents can help the band play on. If you're listening on Spotify or iTunes, I'm looking at a photo of a kid with a tuba stuffed inside of a tiny stand-up tent with his neck contorted like he was in a car crash, just trying to stay alive until the end of the class. <laughs> I mean, this is what someone would look like if you walked up to a car flipped upside down, bent down and looked through the driver's side window. No one sees a problem with this. 
Another good one is the one where they tell you you have to wear a mask to walk to your table at the restaurant. Oh yeah, we've all been through that one. Then when you get to the table, you can take it off and spread your viruses amongst your friends and onto your plates. You just can't do it on the way to your table. Only at the table, among your friends, and into your plate that you hand to the waitress who takes it and walks through the same path you did to get there, passing even more tables than you did, and into the kitchen. And if you ask anyone in the entire building how that makes sense, no one will be able to answer you. Yet, we'll all collectively enforce it and abide by it. We're all agreeing to play pretend. Everyone just blindly submits to authority. Do you realize you could stand in front of any business with a lint roller in hand, pretend you work there, and make everyone who approaches you raise their arms, and they'll let you scan them with the lint roller? Don't believe me? This guy already tried it. Yeah, here's a video of a guy. Look at him. Just waving the lint roller around on these people. Just waving them in. Guy doesn't even work there. Nobody asks questions that just... I, I mean, how do you live like that? No one will question anything. And you're telling me there aren't people in positions of power who take advantage of that? <laughs> anyway. And that's just one problem plaguing our country. What about all the people who want to ban everything they don't like that hurts their feelings? We got to deal with this virus too. The cancel culture virus. They tried to cancel Eminem last week. Eminem. They're, I mean, they're running out of things here. This was, this was mostly coming from Gen Z TikTok kids who don't even know what an actual childhood is. Like, are these kids aware that life existed before them? We were all there. Eminem has been making music for like 25 years. They've been trying to cancel that guy the moment he came out. It hasn't worked. You can't cancel someone whose first single was, I just don't give a fuck. You can't cancel people who don't give a fuck, let alone build an empire around it. Cancel culture only works on people who try to uphold an image. As long as you make it clear you don't give a fuck from inception, they can't take anything away from you. You know why? Because anyone that gets involved with you, whether it's a business partner, sponsor, friends, mentors, whoever it may be, they already know what they're getting into when they associate with you. They like you, and they're willing to invest in you, knowing full well that who they're getting involved with is most likely going to piss a lot of people off. So when your entire circle consists of people who are willing to align with you, knowing the risks of associating with a polarizing figure, when one of these cancel campaigns pop up, it doesn't affect them because the people around them already invested in the thing that they're trying to cancel, which is the this is me, take it or leave it attitude. It's basically what their brand is. <laughs> These kids crack me up, man. This all started on TikTok, apparently. How come they're not upset at the Holocaust makeup challenge that was trending a while back? You ever see that one? Yeah, just completely silent on that one. Yeah, all these girls were literally pretending they were Holocaust victims. That was a trend on the internet. What are we doing, man? These kids have no grasp of reality. You want to see the mentality? On one of my last videos, I compared the effort kids put into their TikTok videos versus the effort kids put into becoming an athlete. And someone wrote, how is becoming the next Michael Jordan better than a TikToker? How do you even answer that question? I mean, I never thought I'd ever have to explain that to someone. I swear, the military is going to stop defending us. I said this before, too. You know, I, I was seriously starting to wonder that in my last video about people who film themselves eating food and how many people across the world just sit and watch them eat. 
I said, there's got to be people in active duty seeing what's going on and thinking, is this who I'm defending? And you know what? After I posted that video, I got flooded with people in the military confirming my fears. Listen to these. This one's from Ethan. As someone deployed, yeah, this makes me question what I'm doing here. Here's one from Mark. I just told my first sergeant I'm quitting tomorrow and showed him this video. My leave packet should be ready by Monday. Here's another from Baron. As an active duty United States Marine, I can say that I am absolutely disgusted with these people. And it just goes on and on. I mean, it's getting to the point where our soldiers are literally questioning if it's even worth it anymore. Scary thought, isn't it? People are so consumed with themselves and dumb shit that they're completely oblivious to what's going on in the world. Like here, you think these two have any idea what's going on in the world outside of their camera roll? If you're just listening to this, it's just a clip of your typical narcissist blocking everyone's path on a sidewalk to take pictures of themselves. Just oblivious to their entire surroundings. Joey, what are these fucking people go doing? The go deep picture. The fucking yeah. people. No, the Joey B. Tunes. He fucking, we make fun of all these people all the time. Go and they're like, take, do my hair good. As the dog, I'm just going to zoom in on the dog. The dog yeah, makes yeah, me happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at the dog. Guilty pictures of her. Because I'm telling you, no. Please. I got to go to work. No, no, no. Hey, go. fluffy dog. <laughs> you bad. Fuck these morons. I mean, if we just stop doing anything to inspire each other, like, isn't that what the Grammys used to be for? I watched maybe two minutes of that plate of dog shit steam before I just couldn't take anymore. I mean, I tune in and you got Cardi B and Megan the Stallion, two women humping each other on a bed on a stage to a song called Wet Ass Pussy with animated cum splattering on the screen behind them. Primetime American television. This is what we celebrate now in America. This is what we normalize. This is what our youth emulates. This is what we reward with likes now. This is our culture now. And if you have a problem with it, you're sexist. And you're racist. And you're homophobic. This is the attitude of people who contribute to a demoralized nation. They see no value in having societal standards or personal boundaries. So when you say this isn't good for society, they don't understand why you would think that. They just know it's their body, their choice. They can't grasp the concept that the things they choose to do with their body along with the when and the where they choose to do it, has an effect on people who see it, especially on children. And I've seen Cardi B respond to that. And, and she goes, it's not my job to monitor what your kids watch. It's the parents. Then she debuts a new Cardi B doll marketed to kids. See, it's just never-ending hypocrisy, idiocracy. There's just holes and inconsistencies in these people's logic the size of sinkholes. Then you got this guy, Trevor Noah. Says he's always dreamt of being in bed with Cardi B. Oh, guys, guys, wait, wait. I just realized something. This is a dream. This is a dream that I've had. To be in bed with Cardi B. <laughs> I mean, you got pretty low standards there, dude, if you want to be in bed with a stripper who drugged and robbed men. I mean, that's like Oprah Winfrey saying she's always wanted to be in bed with Bill Cosby. I mean, dude, what's wrong with you? And this is a guy who has a political talk show who thinks he knows what's best for the country. I, I, I can't even... Ugh. You know, I, I gotta move on from this. I don't know what's going on anymore. Anyway, I signed into my YouTube yesterday and I got a recommended video that was titled Joey B. Tunes. That's it. The name of the video is Joey B. Tunes. And it's just a video of a woman filming her dogs playing. I know you like an animal video. I know you like it. Here we go. Here we go. Yep. I can't make any sense of it. Look at this. 
What does this mean? I mean, she seems like a nice lady. What do I have to do with this? Thank you. You know, I'd rather watch three hours of this than the Grammys ever again. If I had the choice to watch this in a movie theater with state-of-the-art surround sound or the Grammys, I would choose this. That's how bad that was. Ugh. What are people doing, man? Actually, we already know. We see a window into people's lives every time we log onto the internet. Here, let's just see what people are up to. Let, let's just scroll through TikTok. Hi, do you guys ever take a shit so violent that it feels like you've shot out half your body weight through your asshole? Like your ass is a little faucet and you've turned on the running water? Because that's what just happened to me today. Okay, a little life update from Miss Anal Faucet. What else we got? Hey, could I sleep in your bed? I shit in mine. Now that's wifey material right there. I have magnetic balls on my nose. I have magnetic balls on my nose. Watch what happens when I take one of the magnetic balls off my nose, bestie. It fell. 288,000 followers. Not this guy again. I'm still not convinced he's real. He's got to be animated, right? Oh, this is nice. A girl twerking on a dog. All right, I'm done. Oh, boy. All right, so my next guest is a political cartoonist. He's a weekly contributor to the Washington Examiner. The author of Savage Memes Volume 1 and 2. His comic strips can be found all over the internet. Made by Jim Bob. What's up, buddy? Hey, how's it going? Thanks Good, for having dude. me on. Love dude, the show. A, dude, it's a pleasure to chat with you, man. We've been following each other for a while. You know, I was going through your uh, your book again earlier today. I got it right over here. This shit, man, this never fails to crack me up. You know, you got a great way of highlighting the hypocrisy of some people in the most simplistic of ways. Like, there's this one here, man. There's a guy. I love this one. It's a guy, overweight guy with McDonald's in his hand. Pills behind him wearing a Pornhub shirt saying, the coronavirus sounds kind of dangerous. Now, that's a real person. There's actually people out there like that. What's even more insane is that there's people out there that are more upset at you for making this type of stuff than the guy you're portraying. If anyone needs a talking to, it's the guy in the comic. What, 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 do, you, what do you think is causing people to dismiss all of the dangers in the world and pretend like we haven't been putting each other at risk our entire lives, whether it's getting in a car, eating poorly, having sex, spreading colds, flus. I mean, the list goes on. Why yeah. are those things never a topic of concern anymore? I think it's because of compliance. It's almost like, uh, you know, when you ha you're, you're going to go to a, like you're going to a party you don't even want to go to and it's unfair that you have to go so you have to bring someone else to the party and it's like right. this mutual um it's a mutual sort of um um masochism sadomasochism and so where these people walking around and they feel in fear and so it's not fair if you're not in fear so they have right. to they have to they have to guide you and say no 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 if i'm going to be doing this you know as ridiculous as i feel um, and, and as submissive as I feel, you're going to, you have to do it. And so they don't really care about comparatively what else is, uh, dangerous out there. I mean, they wouldn't drive, they wouldn't do a lot of things right. if they really thought it was about danger. It's not, it's about compliance. It's about, uh, fear, mind control. And it's just, it's gotten to a level of absurdity where you're just like, why, like you can't even you can't even um, approach it rationally, like with logic, no. because it's so beyond it that there's no point in even doing that because people are so far gone now. You you can't even have the conversation with them, and you're right, man. They they don't they can't grasp the concept that you're not living in fear. Like right. they don't understand it. Like that's the basis of their whole complex. Is like when you talk to them, they're like, "Why aren't you scared about this?" It's right. like. 
I don't know. Like I, I'm pretty. I thought we all understood what life was. I thought we understood that the moment you leave your house, you're putting yourself at risk. Like like you just learned this now. Like right. the, this virus is the the first time you ever thought how dangerous life is. Like, dude, this is the fucking jungle, man. This has always oh, been yeah. a fucking jungle. You know. Yeah, and it also gives them. It's a unique scenario because um, it. The whole narrative, how it was introduced, how it parallels movies that we've been seeing for years, everything's so perfect uh, as far as cultivating a narrative. But the special thing is it gives everyone the opportunity to be the hero, right? And the victim at the same time. You right. know, they're they're a victim of this thing that might kill them and their grandma, but at the same time, they're the policia also. And it's like, it's a rare time in, in, uh, in human history where you can be both and be anonymous. It's like everyone outside wearing a mask is actually in the chat room because yeah. they can stay and do whatever they want. Right. Their confidence is boosted because they're anonymous. And that right. part is a psychological element I don't think uh, gets much talking about it, uh, at all because just think about it. Think how confident people can be when they're hidden, when they can do anything and say anything they want. Right. They can go after people. They can bully people. Right. It's because they're in a chat room in reality. But you do a good job at like dismantling these people's arguments in like the most simplistic of ways. You know, what is it about people who just refuse to acknowledge the hypocrisy of their ways, even when absolute proof of their hypocrisy is right in their face? What is it about? I don't understand. It's like video evidence is no longer good enough. Oh. Photographic evidence. I mean, I, I watched, I don't know if you've ever, I, I actually, I know you've seen this, that, that video interview back in, I think it was like 1983, uh, of that ex KGB agent, uh, oh, yeah. Yuri Bezmanov. I don't know if I'm saying his name right. And yeah, he basically, yeah, he, he explains it plain as day to him. And he says, these people won't realize until the boot is on their neck. They are contaminated. They are programmed to think and react to certain stimuli in a certain pattern. You cannot change their mind, even if you, if you expose them to authentic information, even if you prove that white is white and black is, uh, is black, you still cannot change the basic perception and the logic of behavior. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. When a military boot crashes his then he will understand, but not before that. That's the tragic of the situation of demoralization. I mean, right. is that, I, I, everything he said seems to apply to today, and I feel like uh, people just don't want to admit that that's happening in real time to us. No, they can't because like what he said uh, is that uh, the prerequisite for all of it is demoralization. Right. People don't realize it's at, it really is, and I believe this wholeheartedly, is that it's at a spiritual level. If you're, if you're not aware of what uh, nonsense is what degeneracy is. If you're right. not capable of pointing out north from south and east from west on a map, uh, the map of you know the social map, the the cultural map, and the moral map, you are lost. You'll believe anything. You'll it doesn't matter. And that's why information doesn't matter. We're post info. We're post reality. Where um, moving people. It's always their spirit that's moved. It's never their mind. Their mind is, uh, all of our minds are suggestible. Like they're in a suggestive state. And so if you're not grounded in all those other areas, in my view, uh, you're going to be subject and vulnerable to a lot of lies and you won't ever know what's true. And, and we're both, we're definitely living in a time where upside down is, is right side up and, you know, male is female, yeah, everything's yeah. upside down and backwards and inverted. Yeah. And if that became the norm over the past 50 years, maybe hundred years through some process, like Yuri Bezmenov pointed out, um, there are going to be generations of people our age and below who don't know what's true or not. And they're just, if you don't know what's true, it, now it makes sense. It, if someone doesn't know what's true, fear uh, is going to be their primary state because right. they're constantly protective. They don't know. Like, you, you know what I mean? It's like you're stuck in the woods. You don't know what's true in a way that you don't know what's around you because you don't you yeah. can't tell what what you're looking at. You're in the dark. 
you're reaching for things, you're yeah, jumping yeah. at everything. If someone says there's a spider on your, you know, your shoulder, you're going to freak out, you yeah. know? And, uh, I think everybody's in that. Uh, a lot of people are in that. And then the people who pointed out like myself and yourself and many, many others who are doing a great job at just showing the ridiculousness. And I think the key is for those of you who really want to like, you know, wake people up, you have to use humor and take the piss out of people. And, uh, cause the unifier is, um, the unifier is humor. The unifier is we're all, we're all in a, this shit storm together. And, um, and, you know, you, you can give people some levity, uh, as opposed to like making them feel like more uh, scared and shit. You well, know that's I mean? why they want to censor comedians. They know how uh, powerful yeah. humor is. It's obvious, right? Think about how powerful humor is, is that you could literally be in a room with somebody that wholeheartedly disagrees with you on a subject. But if you can find a hole in their logic somewhere and, and make a joke about it and make them laugh make them laugh your biggest critic it's almost like you got them it's like it takes them where they have to laugh at their own silliness to get them to even let you in in the i with the idea of they might be a little off yeah the humor thing is so important um it is. what you were saying is like um i was thinking about it like on the playground let's say people disagree like kids and there there's a new kid in school and, and they're picking on them if that kid doesn't act like a victim and create yeah. standards where he can't be the subject of ridicule and, and whatnot. Yeah. If he takes the abuse and, and laughs it off, he's in, he, it's right. like the ultimate unifier. That's why these protective, like, uh, let veils and these protective classes where you can't make fun of this person because they're ex. you can't yeah. make fun of them because of this and trying to create these like isolated bubbles, uh, protecting these people in groups or as individuals, from humor, from the, from yeah. the unifier, like you said, there's a purpose why that's happening. And it's not because it's, it's virtuous to protect people based on their skin color, sexuality, right. and whatnot. It's because they know it unifies. That's the danger of comedy to the, a ruling class. Speaking of comedy, man, I got to commend you uh, how far you've come with your animation skills lately. I remember talking to you a while back. You were experimenting with a few different programs. And there's one cartoon you did recently that had me laughing my ass off. And I continuously go back to it. I must have watched this like 25 times. It's Ben Shapiro on a date with Jordan Peterson. Oh, uh, yeah. Look. It's clearly the end of the world, and there are many things that I've never experienced. One of those things is a pulled pork sandwich. Another is one night stand. Well, that depends on what you mean by pulled pork. I mean, it's not like I know you very well. I mean, you've clearly done a lot in the arena of debating children, and it's commendable, but, you know, I, I don't just hop on the bloody pole of any old archetype. Here's the thing. I would never ask for anything more than a voluntary exchange of services. Nobody has the right to someone else's labor and I would without question refuse a handout from a professor. Although I do find your hands very appealing in this moment, and I am particularly fond of your toenail polish. You know, to be honest, I'm not entirely certain I'm prepared for this, so it's probably a good idea that we establish some basic rules and boundaries. Absolutely. Well, I'm not sure that it matters, but perhaps we can first examine how compatible we are insofar as our hierarchy of values is concerned. Look, this doesn't have to be very complicated. <laughs> Well, I think it's safe to say that that ship has sailed. We're both complex beings, and, you know, life is complicated, and it's ugly and, and messy and, and full of chaos and uncertainty. I'd go so far as to say it's mostly suffering. With all due respect, I'm going to disagree with you. We live in the greatest country in the world, with the least amount of suffering, and I'd argue that we can attribute that to capitalism. So well, if you want to debate me about this, we can go ahead and do that if you like. Or I can make you a virgin Cosmo, and I can show you how soft my sheets are. I'd really much more prefer if we did something a bit more childish, you know, and playful. Like what? Um, well, it's going to sound silly, but um, do you have any remote control cars? I, I gotta say, that might be the best Ben Shapiro impression in the world right now. Well, thanks a lot. I mean, I really appreciate that. I mean, I don't really, uh, I don't really back anything that that Jim Bob guy does. I, I, I think he's deplorable. <laughs> Uh, but, but the thing is he, he knows how to do his stuff and, and I appreciate that. That is what the free market allows for. And that, that is why we live in the best uh, country in the nation. I mean, the n best nation in the world. And it's pretty simple. Um, yeah, people love that because, uh, the two of them are in the same plane of politics in a way. And right. they're sort of like the, uh, authorized, right. 
in a way, you know, I wouldn't right, call right. them right, right. But they're, they're the acceptable mainstream sort of narrative thing that you can play with. Right. And so I love doing stuff like that because my base is pretty much center, right? Except for the people that hate me, but I welcome right. them too. Um, but they get so uptight when I go after people on the right. It's That's what's really fun for me in this yeah. last sort of year is going like, Oh, the le- like making one of these people is really easy. I mean, the blue haired social right. justice weeb. I mean, how many times can I do it? But when you go after more subtleties in your own sort of camp, so to speak, right, it gets really fun because uh, you know it it ruffles feathers that are it just really does. It really yeah. does. It's funny because you're like me, where it's like you kind of focus on behavior, yeah. which kind of just you know scales across all sides of the spectrum you know what i mean and it's just funny because it's like we know i look at ben shapiro as like maybe one of the most squeakiest clean guys on planet earth and his voice you know kind of represents that the way how how he speaks it's like he's never gotten trouble in his entire life no fights no stealing no degeneracy whatsoever that's why he flips the fuck out when he sees like a cardi b video you know i was like i wonder if the guys even tried a cigarette before i could see him at nine years old in the woods standing in a circle of friends while they pass a cigarette around being like you do realize they're all what you're doing is completely illogical there's no beneficial factor to smoking a cigarette it tastes terrible gives you cancer your breath smells why would you do it (laughs) yeah he's never had dirt under his fingernails like the the kids in class were uh trying to match up a praying mantis with a spider and he was just like "Ah, i'm gonna throw up this is disgusting (laughs) this is this is violence this is oh it's just like, but it's like it's, I agree with him, but it's just funny, like how he, how, how disgusted he is about that. Oh, uh, no, stuff. yeah. And it's like, I just want to get the guy drunk, let him let loose, have a good time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm working on that, the one where he's in the basement and he's all hunched over and he's, he's stoned. And I'm going to start yeah, I saw that adding one. some, uh, <laughs> some, uh, guests who come over and try to, try to loosen him up. Oh, a little. please do. <laughs> and people are like, he's talking too slow. I'm like, he's stoned. He's that's I he, right. he can talk a little slower, but maybe, yeah. maybe that's wrong. Maybe I got to go speed him up. Like it doesn't affect him at all. <laughs> right. <laughs> Bill Gates is a good one too, man. I like the oh, Willy yeah. Wonka thing that you did. He's such a weird guy too. What is he doing oh. with his hands all the time? You know, oh, man. Those guys <laughs> never act right. I'm going to inject every last one of you. Same. <laughs> I think he's I think he was coached, but he doesn't know how to do it. Like, you know that he coached politicians and they're always like, you know, like it's very specific. Yeah. And they just told Bill Gates all of those. And he was like, I'll use them all. Like, I'll just do everything. And he's just <laughs> dancing around. Like, as long as I get to get inside all, everybody in the in the world <laughs> with my needles. Uh, oh that's, all my God. that's all he's he's just a. I try to have compassion for him coming yeah. from the point of view where people at that level who yeah. accumulate that much wealth and power and influence, it's impossible for them to self appoint themselves. You know what I mean? Like to, to appoint themselves as, uh, uh, as the person who needs to do good in the world through their lens. So, right. so like if you get that much power, it's, imp- it's almost impossible for someone to be like, well, I have to use this ex- time and this, this, moment on earth to do the most good in my view of what's good. And it ends up being some like crazy utilitarian psychopathic, um, you know, trajectory, obviously, because that's how, that's how it's always happened in history where people are like, we're going to make the world a better place. And you're like, right. It's always going to go wrong. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially if you have nothing to do with the medical industry. Oh, I yeah. Mean, who even appointed him as the guy? No. And who even accepts this? Why would you even have this conversation with him on the news? He's all over the news with this. And I just don't get it, man. It's like people are so blinded. It's like all out in the open. It's all right in front of our face. And we just blindly accept it. It goes back to what we were talking about before, man. Like people just don't want to admit, you know, even if the proof is right in front of their face because they're scared, right? You know, you know, you ever notice no one's interested in lowering the curve of car accidents? I mean, but then you put a 24-7 death ticker on the news. Then all oh, yeah. of a sudden they'll care and they'll have experts talking about it. Then over a month, then everyone will be talking about it. I mean, like, that's a fact and people know this. But yet they'll still blindly follow and care about the thing that they're told to care about. It drives me insane, man. Six million 
car accidents a year in America. And there's people stepping out of their car after driving 65 miles an hour in a metal missile, hopped up on caffeine, fidgeting on their phones, flying by families with babies in the backseat, who have the nerve to walk into a grocery store and shake their head at a guy without a mask thinking, that guy's putting us all at risk. I'm Mm -hmm. just fucking done with people. They make no sense. People are just so inconsistent so inconsistent in their convictions why i mean why is that so common man Ugh. i think they just follow i think the power of mainstream and narratives is what what drives people there's no real narrative behind driving people don't think about it they're mostly right. in a chaotic state they don't think about the fear until they're near death you know it's all yeah. behind them and, and right. they justify because they need to get to walmart they just don't think about it they don't they don't really it, it proves that they're not really arguing about death. It's it's yeah. they're arguing. It's just like guns too. It's they're arguing particular kinds of death and they're making up arbitrary standards for why this particular kind of death is okay. And this yeah. kind is not. And then, you know, they don't even know what they're arguing. I just look yeah. at it like people live through a story lens and yeah. this story, you know, they've been doing this, pandemic stuff for a while now. It just, they, they didn't have the operation and the mechanics and the technology to do it at such a massive scale until recently. And so if you look at the, you know, the internet of things, the smartphones, the connectivity, the, the, the speed of, of, uh, interactions, um, before it was only possible in, in nations, like inside of nations or even inside of cities where you're like N1, N1, H1, you know, like if you look back at that stuff, it was very similar. They had the same level of um, sort of like um, exaggeration on the news and all the, you know, the stingers and the the people where they actually did say like wearing masks and they had set up tents for testing and all this stuff. We just don't remember it because it was like it came and gone. It was just it was like, all right, that silliness. Every two years, there's some new virus. Right. We're used right. to it. Right. We're just like, yeah, yeah. But this one, I think the the narrative was delivered at such a a massive scale and all of the language was the same on every scale for every country that's what yeah. weird to me where it was like okay no, that doesn't happen about yeah. 193 countries don't get together and use the same exact lingo for every single thing you're like this yeah, is a top right. down you know arguing you know the the particulars of of said virus and the dangers and the all that shit to me that's like I like like you said, looking at behavior, I I go, well, these are we are programmed just like uh, you know if you're not open if you're not open to looking at the truth, you will be programmed. You yeah. will follow along, and it's very difficult to say no because um, the part um, the part that they have uh, fully advantageous to them, and I mean them like ruling class people who want to engage in this new system of compliance, right? Um, the, the thing they have is we're all dependent, right? On conveniences, on Amazon, on the biggest corporations. We get whatever we want really quickly, right? We just order it, we yeah. get it. We're used to that. Yeah. And so it's when you set up that system before all of this happened, you could pretty much tell them they have to do whatever you say if they want their yeah. goodies because we're so used to it and we're all we're all vulnerable you and I right. we all have a level of convenience to our lives that uh, given the scenario where we have to comply with something it's going to be at some point there's a threshold where we're going to be like no I'm not doing that but there's going to be threshold where we're like okay I'll do that as long as I can keep my life and logistics going right because right. we don't want to be stagnant you know so yeah. That fascinates me too. The whole compliance uh, relationship to convenience, and I I see those directly connected in what's going on. Well, you do a great job at trying to uh, wake people up to the absurdities of the coronavirus narrative. Oh. And you're, I mean, your book is de- like half of the book's dedicated. And I got to ask you, like, did, have you ever gotten through to people? Like, have you ever gotten people going like, wow, like, you know, I've been following you for a while and I, I kind of get your point and, and it's kind of making me realize that maybe, you know, it is not what I thought it was or, you yeah, know what I mean? Like, time. have you had, have, have you, have people open the window slightly at all for you? Yeah. Some people open the window. What, that takes time. And so like, if you give them a bit of information early on 
And then they're like, that's bullshit. And then later it ends up being true. You may not even get ever get credit for right. saying it. it doesn't really matter. It's, it's not our info. It's not, we yeah. don't own it. We're just relaying what seems to be ridiculous. But um, so that's happened. But I think out of every, out of all of the things that have, that have impacted people, it's um, two things. One, when you go into physical space and uh, where you would ordinarily look at someone in fear covered in five masks, you'd be like, oh, you're disgusting. But uh, when you take the approach that you ask to see their smile, because that's ultimately the the most infectious thing, that's the real contagion uh, to my in my view. If you get them to smile and open up their face, um, they realize a lot more um, than information. They realize they're covering their beingness. They're covering their whole communicator, the thing that makes them smile, the things, the thing, the way we exchange in, in social interactions require us to actually emote, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and give our laughter and joy or even anger and understand each other that way. And so they, I think people see that's missing and they're like, oh yeah, I forgot. That's what it requires for being human is to have a face. And so that's yeah. one aspect that has nothing to do with the truth of vaccines or not, right. or the truth of coronavirus and this and that. And that's why I try to operate outside of information because that just goes back and forth. You know, yeah. oh, I have information too. No, I have counter information. It's like, yeah, it's like it's useless. You know, what I say is, what I usually ask people as, as I say, for everything that you've read and seen on your little black mirror phone, and I get the irony that I do a lot of stuff through this phone. Um, but for everything you've gathered from the phone, how much of it is consistent with what you see in direct reality? Do you walk right, outside right. and go, people are dying, you know, like, are they falling over or, you know, does it look, does it match what you're, and the, the answer is always no, they can't possibly say that the, our direct reality external matches the internal of this thing. No fucking way. Yeah. Not even close. That's a great point, man. It brings me back to the last time I kind of got into it with people on an issue when I really was trying to get people to realize this was when I was doing more comics kind of in the nature that you're doing. And it was it was it was during the whole that big body positive uh, mm. shit that was going on last right. year, you know, like you're just being bombarded with this crap. And it, it was probably the most controversial cartoon I made was a comic of Lizzo at the doctor's office, you know, the, oh, the, Lizzo, the yeah, artist yeah, Lizzo. Yeah. yeah the, so the, it's a cartoon of the, her at the doctor's and the doctor says, Lizzo, it looks like you have diabetes. And Lizzo says, uh, excuse me, how dare you body shame me? All <laughs> yeah, her totally. fans just came on my page and right. just lost their shit. And I'm like, wait, but that's what you guys do every time someone who promotes obesity gets criticized. You just default to body shaming. I mean, there's a real danger in promoting obesity. And like you said, it's like that doesn't match the reality of what's going on. Like the reality is, you know, we all know people who have, I mean, my, I have diabetes runs in my family. So I know, you know, it's not like I'm making fun of people with diabetes. I'm saying like, look, this is like a real issue. And you're celebrating this person who's actually promoting uh, obesity. And then they'll be like, well, she doesn't promote obesity. Then the next day she'll be on the red carpet wearing a Hershey wrapper as a dress, <laughs> chewing on right. a Hershey bar. And then you'll, you'll show them that too. And they'll right. still defend her. Be like, oh, well, she was just mocking her critics. Then the next day she's got a bag of Cheetos on her Instagram story. I was like, at what point will you stop living in this delusion and and yeah. what, what is it about this celebrity culture where like as long as they like somebody that's enough for them to defy all logic and reason and just defend them blindly like that's scary man yeah that is a little frightening i mean they in a way it's a indicator of their loss of power is that mm. you know you have to keep um s specializing and you have to keep creating little niches inside niches that represent something. You notice how like the whole identity culture, the whole yeah. identity politics, it, it necessarily splinters. It, you, you have to keep dividing until everybody has their own personal customized identity that has its own oppressive state on the, right. on the, the, whatever the schematics they have now of what that means. And I think the same exists for that, for, uh, you know, obesity or the, way people look or the, their weight. And it's like, everybody has an opportunity to be a victim yeah. until 
there's no more. You know, the Asians, they're trying to push the Asians. And I was like on a live stream and talking about like, they don't care. Asians, yeah. Asians grow up uh, mostly under, under uh, these ferocious mothers who want them to be perfect, where they don't buy this victim stuff. It's not going to work. You know, yeah. they're just like, what? Like, no, I, I, you know what I mean? Like I practice yeah. hard or whatever. Well, I work hard. It's, like, it's funny, man. Like it, you said that it, it can be a cultural thing because, you know, my ancestors came from Italy and I remember, you know, listening to my grandfather telling me stories about how, you know, we were never raised as a victim, right? It was almost like having a victim mentality was kind of like shameful. Like you don't ever want people to look at you, look, look at you like, oh, well, they need help or they know, right. you know, and maybe they do, you know, but it's like, I feel like I, first and foremost is like you put your head down and, and just overcome the obstacles rather than standing in front of the obstacles and pointing at it and yelling at everyone look at why is this obstacle here what are mm -hmm. you gonna don't you doesn't everybody care like that's kind of sad in a way you know and i'm not saying that that doesn't justify whatever why that obstacle is there but it's like i don't know i feel like what i what i came from was like to have a little more pride and just going fucking balls to the wall and like whatever the fuck is in front of you, whatever the obstacles, like life's not easy, man. And I see wow. that though with the Asian culture too, cause you don't, you don't hear a lot of complaining come from them. Never. You know what I mean? No, they, they won't buy it. They won't even flinch. And it. I don't like, know the first what? thing about their culture really to even say, but I, I do notice that I don't hear a lot of that from them. No, no, I have enough exposure to a lot of Asians to even collectively generalize uh, generalize all of them. Um, that, <laughs> that part is missing from the culture. It's not right. there. It's not, they don't have the history. Even the Japanese who were put in internment camps in this country, even given uh, $80,000 to a couple of families, I don't know how many families, they never talk about it. There, there's never a squeak of like, it was uh, not enough, you know, like, <laughs> right, no, right. You know, the, no one cares. They just, yeah. they would rather not have that mindset yeah. Because it's just shameful. It's just like, yeah. you know, they have a longer history of it, but, but it's up for grabs here. I mean, victimhood, it, it comes in a vending machine at this point where you're yeah. just like, oh, cool. I'll get that kind with this color. And it's like, give me my racial abacus so I can yeah. count where I am, you know, and it's all yeah. falling apart. The good news is that stuff all falls apart. Um, and I try to remind people when they get all like uh, scared of it and they they think it's taking over a, a culture of relativism, you know, where everything means nothing and up is down, like we were saying, yeah, and, yeah. and good is bad and sour or sweet. It, there's no foundation if nothing's true. And therefore, e for every new uh, uh, thing that you present, you know, some new, you know, you know, really catchy uh, trope or whatever, it, it's not based on anything true. So it all falls apart. And, and what you see is they all cannibalize each other. So yeah. one person's oppressive state one season is now gone. Oh, you're not, you know, you're not in anymore. That's, you know, math is racist now. It's like, oh, it God. has to actually touch every aspect of reality to show finally how absurd it all is. It's crazy that you say that because uh, math is racist. Cause it was funny how I was seeing a lot of stuff happening recently. Like uh, I, on my last podcast, I was talking about, I found some CNN article about how white paint is racist on robots yeah. and all on this robot. stuff and all these things. And the Dr. Seuss thing, like, and it's like, oh my God, okay, I guess this is what we're doing now, you know? And, and then I made a joke somewhere. I don't know on what platform about how like math will be racist next. And never, yeah. and then I just got flooded like, no, 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 it already is. Like, here's the article. And I'm like, all right, it's, it's done. That's why I was like, I can't, I can't be sucked into that vortex anymore. Like that, no. it's like, like that is such a, I mean, to, to think that there's people that will live and die believing all of that and hanging on to that. And they got to prove to people that this is all like, what a miserable existence that is. That's such a negative way to just run your life out. Like it is, it's, it's, it's actually sad. sad. That's why I bring in like compassion. Cause it's easier to get angry. And these people yeah. are like, you know, they're just in their own world. You're, you just want to shake them, you know, yeah. but, but it's really, it's actually ends up being kind of sad because they're living someone else's narrative that they fed them. That's, like they're actually the selling this narrative to people and then they yeah. buy it and they run with it. And then it's just like, oh man, you got to get out of it because it's, it's not fun. You're not happy. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. see everyone as a potential threat or enemy, you know, you're, you're, 
walk, you have everyone around you walking on eggshells. Like you're not, yeah. when you're not fun to be around, it really it ends up being that simple. Like it yeah. doesn't, yeah. it, it ends up not being about like who's, who's legitimately victimized in this country or whatever. It's just about, yeah. can, are you, do people like being around you or not? You know, you're never going to get to people to stop uh, hating somebody, even at the farthest end of the realm of, let's say, just pure on racist right. hatred. Like, you're never going to stop that guy. I mean, to dedicate your life to that. I mean, I guess it's an honorable venture to try to stop that, but it's like to consume your life with it. You know, if you're not out there picketing or you're not out there getting into government, I mean, you're just working at a grocery store and then, like, you're just old at night going off on Facebook or like you're disassociating with this person because they right. shared a, 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 a chapter from a Dr. Seuss book. No, he's race. I want to, it's exactly. like, you're going to destroy your life. Like you're literally going to be miserable and alone at the end of your life. It's like, true. You know, and it's like, and they, and they vilify people like us that we even will talk about the subject or, you, yeah. you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, you know, what's so interesting about it? it's like, we're actually the ones that give a shit about them because right. what are we talking about? We're like, that's sad. Right. I don't want them to be sad. Like you no. said, you want to shake them and say, stop doing this. Go look outside. It's beautiful. You know what right. I mean? And it's like, but somehow they they want to vilify guys like us. And, and right. it's funny because, and I wanted to bring this, this going back to cartoons stuff, and I want to bring this up, but by association. Now, you're friends with Owen Benjamin. Mm -hmm. who is a you know most people know he's banned from everything, everything. Yeah. but it's funny because i while i got you and i wanted to bring this up to you because this has been bothering me so i did a drawing a while back where i put joe rogan's face on a toe and called oh, yeah. it toe you, rogan. Yeah. Or, do you remember yeah. that okay oh, yeah. so i'm bringing this up because i, I did now I, I originally did this because i had watched the clip of joe describing himself by saying he looked like a thumb with two thumbs. I right. thought that was hilarious, and I wanted to play off what he said. Now, a few weeks after I posted it, someone sends me a clip of Owen Benjamin showcasing the drawing on his oh, yeah. show. There has been uh, a string of crimes in my area, and there finally has been a police sketch of the guy <clears throat> Apparently his MO is he kicks people in the shin and then he runs and hides in a bar of soap. Uh, he's been nicknamed Toe Rogan. And apparently he's three foot four. So I'm taking all the precautions I can. <laughs> now, at the time, I had only seen Owen from his appearance on Joe Rogan's podcast. I, I didn't know much about him. I, and I had no idea that there was a rift between them. Joe follows me now. <laughs> and I'm curious if he's ever seen that drawing and, and w it, what he thinks of it, if it's tied into how Owen feels about it. And he's probably going to see this. So I don't even know what to make about it. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's, <laughs> I'm sure someone like Joe Rogan sees so much shit where like, right. he can't even, you know, process most of it because there's so much of it. But yeah, no, I don't think that'll. I don't think that'll uh, cause any uh, any waves. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. It's a funny either. coincidence, you know. Before I let you go, man, what do you got? What are you working on next? And where can everybody find your stuff? Um, well, it depends on what you mean by work. You know, it's like you know, sometimes play and work are the same. You know, it's like fuck. <laughs> um, I'm working on Savage Memes Volume Three already. I'm gonna be doing that. Um, I'm just finishing the cover now, and. Nice. Um, I'll be releasing that probably the next week or two for pre-orders. And, um, and so, um, yeah, I've done all three and, uh, it's, it, this one's going to be even more like trying to capture the last year and a half. I know there's a segment, a section in that volume two where it kind of caps uh, encapsulates the, the craziness, but there's actually enough for a whole book, uh, you know, the last year of what we've all experienced. And so, uh, that's what volume three is going to be is all of the nonsense as one big giant almanac of uh, 2020 to 21. And so that's, what's, uh, that's, what's up on my uh, plate. And the rest is like, you know, getting further into animation and, you know, doing more of the stuff that you said you like um, just little fun conversations between the people that I'm able to impersonate and, uh, and trying to draw that out a little bit more. Cause it would be fun to uh, just do that, you know, full time. I don't know the, I don't know what the 
platform style is or how that I can make that possible. But that's a fun challenge for me to uh, explore that. And, and animation takes time and, and effort. And so it is, it is rewarding because there's a lot of work. Whereas most of my drawings look like they're, you know, they're drawn by an amputee. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the South park situation where it yeah, doesn't exactly. matter. It's all about the humor. Exactly. Right. So yeah. that's awesome, man. Well, look, where can everybody find you and where can everybody get, get the, uh, volume two is volume two, the only one available. The I don't think you have volume out. one out anymore, there's, right? There's no? no more volume two. It sold out okay. uh, three days ago. And awesome. so volume three, you can get, um, in the next week or so you can go to made by Jimbob.com or you can just follow me on Instagram, which is just made by Jim Bob. And, uh, I'll be posting here and there. Like I'll po- post the cover and, um, you know, what I do for pre-orders is I have a whole villain sticker pack. That's hilarious. Like Nancy Pelosi and, and all of the characters in the, uh, political, um, zeitgeist. And, um, so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of fun bonuses that I include f- for the, uh, the book sales. So, um, yeah, but, uh, otherwise you just find, find me on made by Jim Bob at Instagram. That's pretty much my main thing. I totally yeah. quit Facebook. I know Instagram's a, a sister company of Facebook, but, um, I couldn't handle it anymore over there. And, yeah. um, I haven't been able to get really involved with telegram. I don't know why I think it's too much like just t- I feel like I'm on a group text and I'm just like, what am I, what is this? I, yeah, t- I've, I've never been on there or Gab or anything else, but I, I I'm, just, I'm definitely looking to go. Like you said, Facebook, my page is about to be unpublished. It said that for like a year. I can't gain any followers. I get like a message pops up that says, are you sure you want to like this? Please look at the material this man yeah. shares before you yeah. accept it. It's like, you know, it's is ins- this happening when you share like ISIS, ISIS yeah. recruitment? Exactly. Anything, you you know what sure, I mean? Next year, it's going to be, are you sure you want to feel that? You know, are you sure you're you know, serious? Are you sure you want to think that, Joey? Oh, God. It's that so disgusting, hurt. man. Yeah. Well, look, man, thanks so much for doing this, man. We got to do it again. No, anytime, dude. All right, thanks brother. for having me on. We're out of here. Goodbye. Goodbye.